And because I have to be at work at 6 a.m. again, so I want to start a little bit early. So I'm going to settle back in and jump right into our two articles. Um, still reading in Forbidden History. Okay, we are in, we are just starting into section, or part five, Ancient High Tech. So our first article is A, C- a Conversation with Peter Tompkins, Secrets of Forgotten Worlds by J. Douglas Kenyon, our editor. Um, it's five pages, and then we'll follow that up with one more um, on ancient agriculture. Um, yeah. So, yeah, let's just jump into it. Um, For the many who date their personal discovery of the wisdom of the ancients and the power of unseen forces with the late 1960s and early 70s, two books enjoyed nearly unequaled per- uh, influence. The Secret Life of Plants and The Secrets of the Great Pyramid were both runaway bestsellers, which, if nothing else, put the Orthodox establishment to considerable trouble defending itself. While today, notions such as the preference of plants for good music and the miraculous measurements of the Great Pyramid may have become somewhat passe, 25 years ago they caused quite a stir, and in the process, earned not a little not a little notoriety for the author Peter Tompkins for one for one who had dared to challenge to flagrantly so flagrantly the titans of the scientific establishment Tompkins achieved not only celebrity but also for a time an unprecedented measure of predictability And actually, when he said 20 years ago, this was 20 years ago. So 40 years ago, those things were really big. Um, Both books remain in print, but Tompkins, though scrupulous in his research, came to be dismissed by the conventional as something of a crank. Two of his other books, Mysteries of the Mexican Pyramids and Secrets of the Soil, have done little to change his undeserved reputation. 
Nevertheless, he remains busy and unrepentant. He is a seminal, fascinating figure, and Atlantis Rising was lucky enough to interview him in order to discuss his views on a number of interests that he shares with the magazine. Originally from Georgia, Tompkins grew up in Europe, but returned to the United States to study at Harvard. College, though, was interrupted by World War II. Initially employed by the New York Herald Tribune, Tompkins began the war as a correspondent. Soon he was broadcasting for Mutual and NBC. By the end of the war, he was working with Edward R. Murrow and CBS. In 1941, his reporting career was interrupted by a stint in the TOI, a precursor of the OSS, which ultimately became the CIA. Five months were spent behind enemy lines, quote, at the Anzio Landing, he recalls. General Donovan and General Park sent me into Rome ahead of the landing, and had they not failed to arrive, we would have had a big victory. But as it was, we got stuck. Then I had to send our radio messages four or five times a day about what the Germans were doing where they were going to attack, and in what strength, and so on, end quote. During the mission, Tompkins recruited numerous agents who were sent north to link up with the partisans and help clear the way for the planned Allied advance. Eventually, he went to Berlin. When, at the close of the war, Truman abolished the OSS, Tompkins found he had no desire to join the newly organized CIA and went his own way. The years following the war were spent in Italy learning movie making and script writing and developing a healthy distaste for censorship. Quote, I realized the only way I could say what I wanted to say was by writing books. They don't get censored. End quote. Uh, but they get, can get banned. Um, even then, he was finding his views made him anathema to many. Wow, sorry. Um, quote, I got thrown out of more dinner parties, he chuckles, for talking about metaphysical or what were considered crazy notions at the time, so I learned to be quiet, end quote. Being quiet in print, though, has not been his want, nor has censorship of a sort been entirely escaped. Tompkins believes his most recent book, Secrets of the Soils, which he describes as, quote, a cry to save the planet from the chemical killers was virtually squashed by the publisher, end quote, afraid of scaring the public. A follow-up on The Secret Life of Plants, the book spelled out alternatives to the use of chemical fertilizers that Tompkins says, quote, are absolutely useless and only lead to killing the soil and the microorganisms, poisoning the plants and ultimately animals and humans, end quote. Tompkins believes such fertilizers to be primary contributors to the spread of cancer. He could have been on to something there. Um, they've certainly been linked to um, Parkinson's. Um, I think, is it Simplot that has a big uh, to-do going? It has for years over um, links to, to Parkinson's. Anyway, the writer has found his plans thwarted not just by publishers. One idea to use a promising technology he had chanced upon to virtually x-ray the Great Pyramid was apparently blocked by Zahi Hawass and the Egyptian Antiquities Authority. Quote, it would have cost about 50 grand to x-ray the whole pyramid and find out what the hell really is in there, he says. It seemed to me that it would make an interesting television program, but no one was interested. It was very strange, end quote. Yeah, there's a lot of strangeness about the, the pyramids um, as far as what they'll let you do as far as research and what they won't and kind of fishy. One of the recent highly publicized on the recently highly publicized work of the Belgian astronomer Robert Bovel 
purporting to show an alignment between the pyramids and the constellation Orion, Tompkins shrugs. Quote, it's a hypothesis, but it's not provable. I'm only interested in those things about the Great Pyramid that are solid, that are indisputable, end quote. Tompkins wants more than endless theories, of which he claims to have a room full. But he concedes, quote, if you think of the Dogon and the Dogon, D-O-G-O-N, and the serious connection, it's obvious that on this planet people knew a great deal more about astronomy and may have been linked in one way or another with the stars but i'm only interested when someone comes along with fairly hard proof end quote proof of advanced ancient astronomical knowledge tompkins believes is abundant in much of the ancient architecture quote it's obvious that all the great temples in Egypt were astronomically oriented and geodetically, yeah, geodetically placed, he says. Uh, end quote. Uh, he is especially interested in Tel El Amarna, which he sees as the subject of a possible future book. The astronomical knowledge incorporated into the city built by Akhenaten. Akhenaten, uh, I don't know why I couldn't read that one, Tompkins considers mind-blowing, as he puts it. Unfortunately for his plans, though, Livio Catullo Stecchini, the Italian scholar and authority on ancient measurement, upon whom Tompkins relied for much of his work on the secrets of the Great Pyramid, is dead. Interestingly, Tompkins never permitted the secrets of the Great Pyramid to be published in Italy because the publisher wanted to omit Staccini's appendix. The injustice still angers Tompkins. Quote, here's an unrecognized Italian genius, but the Italians said if you print it, you can't have the book. End quote. Uh, kind of a weird sentence. Tompkins' subsequent book on the Mexican pyramids further reinforced his view that the ancients were possessed of advanced astronomical knowledge, though not convinced that the similarities between Egypt and Mexico proved the existence of a mother culture like Atlantis, as some have suggested. He does believe, quote, it's obvious that people went back and forth across the Atlantic, end quote. And he believes the Mexico builders used the same system of measurements as the Egyptians. Quote, I should write another whole book on the subject of what was known on both sides of the Atlantic. End quote, he says. During his Mexico experience, Tompkins succeeded at great expense and difficulty in filming the effect of the rising and setting sun at the equinox on the temple at Chichen Itza. Quote, it's absolutely staggering, he says, but you can see that that snake come alive just on that one day it goes up and down the steps he we filmed it and it's just beautiful how did they orient that pyramid so that would happen only on the equinox end quote answering that question led tompkins to new zealand and jeffrey hodgson who gained fame in the 1920s by clairvoyantly pinpointing the precise position of the planets at a given time convinced by hodgson's Demonstration, Tompkins concluded that he knew the secret by which the ancients were able to achieve their precise astronomical alignments without access to modern instruments. Quote, they didn't need the instruments, he says, because the instruments were built into them. Clairvoyantly, they could tell exactly where the planets were and understand their motion. End quote. Such understanding, while available to the ancients, has been largely forgotten by alienated, high-tech Western society. Quote, we've closed ourselves in, he says. We've pulled down the shades on our own second sight. End quote. Fascinated by clairvoyance and the potential it represents, Tompkins has tried to deploy it as a resource for his more scientific investigation. When his own search for concrete proof of the existence of Atlantis took him to the Bahamas, he used every tool at his disposal. When one site appeared to be 
Littered with ancient marble columns and pediments, it was a psychic who told him that the spot was nothing more than the final resting place of a 19th century ship bound for New Orleans with a marble mausoleum on board. On the more scientific side, clandestine core sampling of the celebrated Bimini Road, Bimini Road? Uh, anyway, convinced him the pavement was not man-made but only beach rock. It took a University of Miami geologist to give him what he wanted. Dr. Cesare Emiliani showed Tompkins the result of his own core sampling over the years in the Gulf of Mexico. Here was conclusive proof of a great inundation of water in about 9000 BCE. Tompkins remembers, quote, Emiliani said, they say that Atlantis has been found in the Azores and found off the coast of Spain and off the coast of the United States. All of these places, he said, could have been part of the Atlantean Empire that was submerged at exactly the date when Plato said it was, end quote. Several, several years earlier, Tompkins had written, for, written the foreword for the English translation of Otto Muck's book, The Secret of Atlantis. Muck's hypothesis that Atlantis had been sunk by an asteroid, Tompkins thought very plausible, and he still thinks so, though it remains to be proved. In Emiliani's work, though, Tompkins believes he had found the only geological proof on the subject. Of course, proved or not, Atlantis, like many other controversial notions, is not like to likely to be readily accepted by the intellectual establishment. The reasons for this seem clear to Tompkins. Quote, they would have to rewrite all their archaeological school books if some of this is proved. If John West's theory about the Sphinx is correct, that it's over 10,000 years old, it's going to change a lot of stuff, end quote. By way of analogy, he describes a man he knows in Canada who has developed a cure for cancer and points out that a threat such a discovery is to the billion dollar a year cancer industry, more than a billion, especially nowadays. A lifetime of searching the hidden byways has made Tompkins philosophical about his own inevitable physical transition. While acknowledging that he is getting on, he says, quote, I'm infinitely more peaceful about the prospect of death like time, it's sort of an illusion. I mean, you lose the body, but what's that? You've had many before, and you'll probably have many after. Maybe you'll do better without them. End quote. At any rate, his productivity has yet to suffer. His next book promises to prove the existence of elemental creatures. The project was inspired by the recent scientific validation of the work of Annie Besant and C.W. Ledbetter, in mapping subatomic structure. Before the turn of the century, the two leaders of the Theosophical Society had decided to use their yogic powers to analyze the elements. Ledbetter saw and Besant drew. When their work was published, no one paid any attention. After all, not only was it impossible to do what they were doing, but their results also contradicted conventional science. Then in the 1970s, an English physicist discovered their work and realized that they were accurately describing quarks and other features of the atom that had only recently been discovered. With such powerful vindication established, Tompkins now goes into the detailed work that the two produced on elemental spirits, as well as the work of the renowned clairvoyant Rudolf Steiner. Quote, if you put it all together, he says, and realize these books... Uh, these books, these people could actually many year could a, could actually many years ahead of the discovery of atoms and isotopes accurately describe and draw them and then look at their description of the nature spirits, their function on the planet, their connection within human beings, and why it is that we should reconnect with them. You have to listen. I mean, it's black and white you can't escape it end quote and and article Whew. that's interesting i haven't heard i have not read Besant or ledbetter i have a bunch of their stuff um and we'll get into that in this series eventually but um i have not read any of it yet 
So when I get ready to um, put out my um, poll on what to read next, I will make sure that uh, I include one or both of them on that list. I know there's a way to do a poll on Twitch. I haven't tried it yet. I've just been doing them on Twitter, um, which uh, limits you to four choices and seven days. So um, I will definitely put it out on Twitter, but if I can figure out how to do it on Twitch too, I'll set it up because I think it can be ongoing for a longer period. Anyway, um, we have one more article tonight. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, really six pages because there's two big pictures. So we'll just jump into it. Um, I really like the idea of those elemental creatures they're talking about. Um, that really wants, uh, makes me want to go read some Leadbetter or Basant. Uh, anyway, the next article, Article 27, is Ancient, Arch uh, ancient Agriculture in, in Search of the Missing Links is the inescapable evidence of a last fountainhead of civilization to be found growing in our fields by Will Hart. One of the most curious aspects of history's mis mysteries is that is that there is anything mysterious to puzzle over. Why would our history or why should our history be full of anomalies and enigmas? We have become conditioned to accept these incongruities, but if we turn the situation around, it really does not seem to make sense. We know the histories of Europe uh, America, Europe, Rome, and Greece, with some precision back 3,000 years, just as we know our own personal histories. We would consider it very odd and unacceptable if we did not. However, when we do go farther back into prehistory than Babylonia to Samaria and ancient Egypt, things get very fuzzy. There can be few possible explanations. One, our ideas and beliefs about the way history happened conflict with the truth. Or two, we have collective amnesia for unknown reasons and or some combination of both. Imagine that you woke up one morning with complete amnesia, no idea of how you got on this planet and no memories of your own past. We are in an analogous situation regarding the history of civilization, and it is just as disturbing. Or let's say that you are living in an old Victorian style mansion full of odd ancient artifacts. That is pretty much our situation as we wander around ancient ruins and through the galleries of museums wondering who made all this stuff and how and why. 150 years ago, much of the history in the Old Testament was considered pure fiction, including the existence of Samaria, the biblical Shinar. Akkad and Assyria. But those forgotten pieces of our past were discovered in the late 19th and early 20th centuries when Nineveh and Ur were found. Their artifacts have completely changed our view of history. Until fairly recently, we did not know the roots of our own civilization. We had no idea who might have invented the wheel, agriculture, writing, cities, or any of the rest of it. Additionally, for some curious, inexplicable reason, not that many people cared to know, and even historians were willing to let the ruins of human history lie buried under the desert sands, that attitude seems as strange as the mysteries themselves. Would you simply accept the situation if you had amnesia, or would you do everything in your power to reconstruct your past and your identity? It seems that there is something we are hiding from ourselves. Some will say it was a mind-wrenching visit by ancient astronauts. Others will argue that there was an ancient human civilization destroyed by cataclysm. In either event, we have apparently buried and forgotten those episodes because the memory is too painful. 
personally, I have not reached a final conclusion regarding those ideas. However, I am sure the orthodox theories presented by conventional archaeologists, histori historians, and anthropologists do not hold up under intense scrutiny. It is curious that we have developed the capability to send space probes to Mars and to crack the human genome and even to clone ourselves, but we are still fumbling around trying to understand the mysteries of the pyramid cultures, of prehistory, and of how we made the quantum leap from the Stone Age to civilization in the first place. It does not add up. Why should we as a species not have maintained the, th the threads directly and concretely linking us to our past? I have this gut feeling that invest investigative reporters and homicide detectives get when they've been digging into an unsolved case for a long time. We are missing some pieces and or we are not looking at the situation correctly and we have we are probably overlooking the means of obvious clues, the meaning of obvious clues, because we have been conditioned to think about the facts in a certain way. Additionally, we have not asked all the right questions. It never hurts to go back to basics and review everything you think you know and what the real facts are. We have always had the choice of trying to make sense of the world or not. Life has given us an incredible amount of leeway and freedom when it comes to knowledge acquisition. Our ancestors mastered the basic rules of the game of survival during the incredibly long time span of the Stone Age. They did not need to know that Earth revolved around the Sun or the nature of the atomic structure to succeed. But after the last Ice Age, something strange occurred, and the human race went through a sudden transformation that sent our race into unknown territory. We are still reaping the consequences of those explosive events. Let us go back and set the stage of early human evolution as science depicts it unfolding. Our ancestors found themselves in a world full of natural wonders, facing the challenges that nature set before them, all having to do with basic survival. To begin with, they had no tools and no choice other than to meet the challenges head on, just as other animals did. We have to keep the realities, realities of this background in perspective. We know exactly how Stone Age people lived because many tribes around the world were still living in this manner during the past 500 years, and they have been studied intensively and extensively. We know that humanity was fairly homogeneous throughout the Stone Age. Even 10,000 years ago, people lived pretty much the same way, whether they were in Africa, Asia, Europe, Australia, or the or the Americas. They lived very close to nature, hunting wildlife and gathering wild plants, using stone tools and stone, wood, and bone weapons. They had learned the art of making and controlling fire, and they had very accurate and detailed knowledge about the habits of animals, the lay of the land, nature cycles, and how to distinguish between edible and poisonous plants. This knowledge and their way of life had been painstakingly acquired over millions of years of experience. Stone Age humans have been wrongly portrayed and misunderstood. They were not stupid brutes, and there would be no modern mind and no modern civilization without the long evolution they went through to establish the basis for all that would eventually happen. They were keenly aware, entirely in commun communion with nature, and unquestioned questionably stronger and more muscularly robust than we are today. In reality, the natural world we inherited from Stone Age men was entirely intact. Everything was as pristine and virginal as it had been during the millions of years of human evolution. Nature bestowed her bounty upon those early humans and they learned to live within that natural framework. Viewed from a statistical perspective, the human status quo is the hunter-gatherer culture that we lived in for 99.99% of our existence as a species, at least according to modern science. It is very easy to understand how our remote ancestors lived. Life changed very little and very slowly. Early man adapted and stuck with what worked. It was a a simple but demanding way of life that was passed on from generation to generation by example and oral tradition. 
There really does not seem to be much mystery about it. But that all starts to change radically after the last ice age. Suddenly, a few tribes began to embrace a different way of life. Giving up their nomadic existence, they settled down and started raising certain crops and domesticating several animal species. The first step towards civilization are often described but never really examined at a deep level. What compelled them to change abruptly? It is more problematic to explain that, that to explain than we have been led to believe. The first issue is very basic and straightforward. Some uh, Stone Age people did not eat grains, and grains are the basis of agriculture and the diet of civilization. Their diet consisted of lean wild meats and fresh wild greens and fruits. To begin with, we will be looking at the extraordinary discordance from a general standpoint by examining this mismatch between characteristics of foods eaten since the agricultural revolution that began 10,000 years ago and our genus's prior two million year history as hunter-gatherers. The present day edible grass seeds simply would have been unavailable to most of mankind until after their domestication because of their limited geographic distribution. Consequently, the human genome is most ideally adapted to those foods that were available to pre-agricultural man. And there are two pictures here. I'm going to go ahead and show them and then I'll go, I'll continue. So, uh, there's the first one. It says something about ancient Egyptian farmers. And then this one, Egyptian threshing, threshing the grain. Okay. This presents us with an enigma that is very, that is every bit as difficult to penetrate as the building of the Great Pyramid. How and why did our ancestors make this leap? As they had little to no experience with wild grains, how did they know what to do to process them, or even that they were indeed edible? Beyond that, by the time of the abrupt appearance of the Sumerian and Egyptian civilizations, grains had already been hybridized, which demands a high degree of knowledge about and experience with plants, as well as time. If you have any experience with wild plants or fruits or any experience of farming, then you know that wild breeds are very different from hybridized cultivars. It is well established that hunter-gatherers had no experience with plant breeding or animal domestication, and it should have taken much longer to go from zero to an advanced state than historians insist it did. We must ask, where did the knowledge originate? How did Stone Age man suddenly acquire the skills to domesticate plants and animals and do it with a high degree of effectiveness? We find purebred dog species like Seleucus and greyhounds in Egyptian and Sumerian art. How were they bred so quickly from wolves? The following issues make the conventional explanations difficult to support. 1. Mankind's very slow process of evolution in the Stone Age. 2. The sudden creation and implementation of new tools, new foodstuffs, and new social forms that lacked precedence. If early humans had eaten wild grains and experimented with hybridization for some lengthy time period and evolved in obvious developmental stages, then we could comprehend it. But how can we accept the scenario of the Stone Age to the Great Pyramids of Giza? Yeah. Plant breeding is an exacting science, and we know it has been done in Sumeria, in Egypt, and by the ancient Israelites. If you doubt that statement, consider that we are growing the same primary grain crops that were developed by the ancients. That is a strange fact, and it begs close scrutiny. There are hundreds of other possible wild plants that could be domesticated. Why have we not developed new grains from the other wild species of the past 3,000 years? How could they pick the best crops with the extremely meager knowledge that they would have possessed had they just emerged from the Stone Age? 
They not only figured out all these complex issues, but they also quickly discovered the principles of making secondary products out of cereals. The Sumerians were making bread and beer 5,000 years ago, and yet their very close ancestors, at least according to anthropologists, knew nothing of these things and lived by picking plants and killing wild beasts. It is almost as if they were given a set of instructions by someone who had already developed these things. But it could not have been from their ancestors because they were hunters and plant collectors. It is very difficult to reconstruct these rapid fire transitions, especially when they were accompanied by radical changes in every other feature of human life. How and why did humans who had known nothing but a nomadic existence and an egalitarian social structure so quickly and so radically change? What compel compelled them to build cities and create highly stratified civilizations when they knew nothing about such, such organizations? During the Epipaleolithic era, circa 8000 to 5500 BCE, the tribes in the Nile Valley were living in semi-subterranean oval houses roofed with mud and sticks. They made simple pottery and used stone axes and flint arrowheads. They were still semi-nomadic and moved seasonally from one camp to another. The vast majority of tribes around the globe were living in a similar state. How do we get from there to quarrying, dressing, and manipulating one to 60 ton stones into the world's most massive structure and in such a short time? This quick transition is all but impossible to explain rationally. All inventions and cultural developments require time and a sequence of easily identified developmental stages. Where are the precursors? It is very easy to trace this path of development during the Stone Age from very primitive tools to chipped axe heads and flint arrowheads. That is what we should find as civilization develops. But where are the smaller scale pyramids? Much smaller. Where are the crude stone carvings that precede the sophisticated stelae? The slow evolution of forms from simple to complex is all that human beings knew, not mud and thatched roof huts, and then large-scale architecture employing megalithic, megalithic blocks of stone and complex artwork demanding master craftsmanship. But developmental phases are simply not there. Sumerian cuneiform tablets described fairly complex systems of irrigation and farming, bakeries, and the making of beer. The Bible tells us that the ancient Jews raised grapes and made wine and both leavened and unleavened bread. We take these things for granted, but the assumption underlying them are never questions. When did they learn to hybridize bread wheat and turn it into flour and bake the flour into bread in such a short time span? Ditto for viticulture. These are not simple or obvious products. We assume that they're ancestors developed farming skills over a prolonged period of time, which is a logical expectation, but that is not the case. The very first and very primitive agricultural experiments that had been documented by archaeologists occurred in Jarmo and Jericho. These were small, humble villages that raised a few simple crops, but they still hunted game and gathered plants, so they were not strictly agricultural communities. The problem is that there is no intermediate step between them and Sumerian e Egypt, just as there is no small-scale ziggurats, pyramids, or any progressive showing that Stone Age artisans could suddenly carve intricate statuary and stelae. The orthodox theories are starting to rely more on the official pronouncements of, th of authorities rather than on well-argued and well-documented facts. We have reached a crisis in the fields of anthropology, history, and archaeology because the conventional theses are unable to solve an increasingly large number of anomalies. The explanations are thin and threadbare and becoming more ponderous and unable to support their own weight. The pieces do not lock together and fit into a smooth, coherent whole. We have mentioned previously in this book a quote by the eminent paleoanthropologist paleo Lewis Leakey. Some years ago, while giving a lecture at a university, Leakey was asked 
by a student about the evolutionary missing link. He replied, there is not one missing link. There are hundreds of, of links missing, end quote. This is even more true for cultural than biological evolution. Until we find those links, we are like amnesiacs struggling to make sense out of our modern lives and our collective history. And that is the end of the article. And that is about all my voice can take in one session. Um, I can start feeling it get my throat get sore. But I do actually want to read more. Um, but because my voice can't handle it um, for more than what I just read, about 10-ish pages, um, I am thinking seriously about adding more sessions through the week so I can read more of this stuff um, over a shorter period of time. Because we're on the 14th um, session reading in just this one book. Um, that's 14 weeks to read this. And I would really like to step it up a bit. So um, I'm already doing a Star Wars reading on Wednesdays. I'm going to try to add in another night that I read to begin with. Just one more night. And... Um, see how that goes generally speaking in the middle of the week i've got the time so i might try for either tuesday or thursday this week and i'll start the session earlier like 8 or 8 30 um, but yeah be looking for that um, we'll work it out um, step it up one at a time and see how it goes ideally right now because i haven't actually done it i'm thinking i want to do maybe three nights a week maybe sunday tuesday thursday um, if i can manage that um, so we can really start getting into some some more of this stuff and get beyond this book because i'm really enjoying it but i'm anxious to get into some of this other stuff we read about so anyway that'll be it for this session i will be back in a little bit to play some fallout 3 and I will see you then.